Uh, hi everybody, my name is Billy Bosworth and uh, I'm not Matt File, as it says on the, on the sheet. I'm uh, the CEO of Datastax, Matt is our co-founder. They got caught down in uh, Austin, Texas on some travel. So uh, much like in my company, I am largely overhead here for this presentation. And Scott is gonna be the one giving you all the meat and the details. But uh, uh, we've just had a really great time in the past uh, couple of days catching up on t different technologies and stuff. And one of the things that is interesting about Scott's case is it's not the typical big data case. It's not a world where they were overwhelmed with a velocity problem, with a volume problem. And what brought them to the world of NoSQL was, was quite different actually. So we'll be discussing a few of those points as he goes through the presentation, but I'll turn it over to him now and let him get it kicked off and, uh, and we'll take it from there and hopefully you guys can get some good data out of this. So Scott, thanks for coming and take it away. Thank you. Hello everybody. Today we're gonna to be talking about getting big data healthy. The company I work for is called HealthX. We're privately held, small company in Indianapolis, Indiana. We have around 60 employees with half those being development and IT staff. What we do is provide insurance sites, insurance companies with web portals. So when you think you're going to your insurance company's site, you're actually going to us and doing all your tasks that you would do on our site. So some of the things we provide are ways to talk to your HR, ways to ask questions to the insurance company, and also things like looking at your claims and um, getting new temp ID cards, things like that. We started in the smaller market called TPAs, which is third party administrators at first, and have now grown to have health plans and Medicaid, Medicare. So health access technology, we are a 100% Microsoft shop. And to be more accurate, now we are a 97% Microsoft shop. We run our server on a Microsoft SQL 2005 database. It's about six terabytes and we run that mirrored and about 3.8 billion rows. So we're not tiny, but we're not by any means big. We obviously run Microsoft IS web servers on the front end and our middle tier is Microsoft also. And of course then we use C Sharp as a programming language. The service that we moved over to Cassandra was our provider directory search. In SQL Server, the team that wrote this service went extremely normalized structure and we end up with about 20, million, or 20 tables, with about 5.7 million records in it. What we found was when the first client requested this new feature, we only added a small segment, just what they needed. Well, then the next client found out we were doing this and they said, oh, we want to do this too, but we need this to be added and we need this to be added. And every single new client we added to the service caused us more index panes. And so what we end up with today is as a member, you can go on our site and find the right doctor for you. So let's say you're having something wrong with your foot. So you're gonna go and look specifically for a podiatrist. You want it to be within 10 miles of your house. Maybe you want the podiatrist to speak German. And so you could do that query to find doctors to meet those criteria. Well, when we originally designed it, it was just to find doctors close to my house. So next thing we know, we were adding new indexes to handle the new search of what their specialty is. Or are they affiliated with a certain hospital? And it kept getting worse and worse. We're adding new indexes all the time. And we would start missing indexes. And we'd have bad joins because of this, so many different tables. We'd run into some bad joins, which would cause us to have poor performance. So we looked at a different option besides SQL Server. And the reason we did that is we're always trying to lower our reads and writes on our main SQL Server. We do that by continual op optimization of all of our store procedures. But this was an opportunity to just move an entire subsystem off our SQL Server and put it into something else. We looked at adding a different SQL Server to do this, but not only do we have the issues with licensing costs of SQL Server, and now with the new licensing being core driven, it was even gonna be worse in our case. We have a SAN behind it we have to also upgrade. And so we started researching different NoSQL solutions. 
And the way that research worked would be my boss as a CTO would hear of some company running some new database, whatever it is. And he would throw it over the wall to me, and I would fiddle with it and try to get it to work, see what the results were, and go on. And he just kept doing this. So we were trying different ones over the years. Some of them, I admit, I couldn't even get installed. So I'm like, that's not a good option for us, because we are in a Microsoft shop. And finally, one day, he threw Cassandra over the wall. And it just clicked. So the biggest thing for me, being more of an IT than a developer, was that my database servers become a farm. It was the one key that caught me with the Cassandra in particular, but NoSQL in general, was that I don't have this big iron box anymore. I can put in lots of little boxes, and I can treat it just like I do my web servers today. So if a web server pages me in the middle of the night and says they're blown up, we turn off the page and go back to bed. If we get one bad page on our database service today, everybody gets that page, and we're all getting up and determining, is this a moment we have to go to the mirror? Is this something we can fix real quick? So that was something that was very intriguing to me, of making that database server not so critical that we could have multiples and it was no big deal. Another thing was maintenance tasks on our system today are kind of ugly. When I need to shut down the database server, I have to choose either to flip over to the mirror, if it's going to be a long outage, or I kind of try to sneak in outages sometimes and get some patches put on as we need. With the provider directory having the search problem, Datastax Enterprise glued Solar to Cassandra. And so now I have DSC search available to me. And for provider directory, let's just index everything and we'll deal with it later. With us choosing to go with a commercial side of the product instead of just doing Cassandra only was because this was a major transition from us to go from completely Microsoft stack to open source stack. We were going to need some help and DataStax was there for us and was really helpful with us getting us going early on. So Scott, before you uh, go off this slide, we were um, talking quite a bit about some of the conversations we're hearing here at the show. There, there is no small amount of passion in debating between the traditional relational technologies and these new technologies. So you being 100% Microsoft shop, you, you told some good stories last night, I think might be helpful for people. What, what cultural barriers were you hitting in addition to the technology barriers, right? Because you had the technology considerations on the one side, but you had an army of people who have been doing this for a long time, right? And 100% Microsoft shop. Well, what was that like? Um, first, it was really interesting. My lead developer I was going to need to use on the Cassandra project, he wears Microsoft socks, he bleeds Microsoft, he uses Microsoft only exclusively. That is his choice for everything. And here I was telling him, you need to learn Java. And he's like, I know Java, but I choose not to use it because C Sharp is better, you know, whatever. So he really struggled at first with that, but I gave him the ability just to do whatever worked for him. So he actually ended up with pieces of it wrote in Java, pieces of it wrote with Python and PyCasa as he's just been learning new tools and now it's fun for him. Um, I know it's not really part of this, but we just implemented some new stuff on some monitoring and he actually wrote it all in Python. It's becoming his little language of choice right now. So the, we ended up with part of us. I was more of a Unix background, so it wasn't, the transition wasn't as bad for me. The, other developer was more excited about the ability just to do something different. And then um, the third developer, he kind of got into it eventually, but it, it took a while. It was a rough transition. So our solution is, our DSC ring is three commodity class machines. I specifically went with our standard web server config and added disk, that was it. So when I looked at buying a new database server, just the server alone, the three rings run about half the price, or the three machines run about half the price as what one of my database servers would run. We still had some things on the provider data that we used inside of our application. And so what we decided to do for our solution was let SQL still handle the ETL. We do all kinds of um, tasks on our data as it comes from our clients and before we put it into our database. Why do we want to rewrite that for Cassandra. So we loaded the data still through SQL, extracted back out of SQL, getting the exact answers we needed to solve these queries, 
made this, we only made a small change to our data access layer. Basically, if the DSC record exists, we convert the query to the solar search. And, but then the goal was to have standard results pulled back to our system from either side, whether it's Cassandra or um, SQL. And then we needed the ability to move clients back and forth at will because we just knew that this was going to be a big change for us and we needed to be able to go back to home, but in a way, back to SQL. And one thing also, as this has started and moved forward, we've used a lot of different terms. So if I say DSC, if I say solar, if I say Cassandra, if I even throw in a Cylandra, it's all the same to us. I'm talking about DSC using the search abilities. So loading the data. The actual extracting of the data, we use a mix of Java and Python PyCasa. The reason we chose Java for the first part was specifically because I had Microsoft drivers. It was something that made our developers comfortable, that they knew that we had a good drivers talking to the SQL server. So the Java program, all it does is literally extract the data out in the, from the data that we needed from these stored procedures. So we had two stored procedures we had to worry about. We looked at what the results were from that and pulled all the data needed from those stored procedures. Then we have our Python piece, and the Python piece transforms the data, creating a hash field of our multiple keys we needed to get unique records, and converted the dates and geolocation formats to what solar and solar needed. Then at this point, we just use PyCasa, Python PyCasa, to load the data to the DSC ring. Our data set is actually small, just a very, very small segment of our system, but we wanted to test and see how this would work. So we can reload our entire DSC ring in under an hour. It runs about 64 gig. So if you think about our six terabyte database, which is our SQL production, we pulled off a little teeny tiny chunk of the 64 gig and use this as our test case. But the test case we're taking all the way to production. So we didn't have to redeploy up the entire world to get this accomplished. We just took one small subsystem and moved it over. With your um, small three node ring, uh, talk a little bit about your data center considerations. How we talked about how you have a single data center, but yet you kind of treat it like two, and it was important for you to spread that, that load across, correct? Yes, so our data center is unique, unique for us in the fact that we actually have each room, it's like their own mini data center. So each room has its own AC supplies, each room has its own network, each room has its own power. So we put ourselves into two different rooms for redundancy. So one room is powered by company A, another room is powered by company B. And that allows us to have a good redundancy even though we're in one data center. And so we've had power issues and stuff like that where we've lost one room, but the data center itself, the other side was still fine. When we put DSC in place, we needed to take advantage of the same thing. So I actually have Every single of the three nodes, they're all in a different rack, and they're also split between the two different rooms. We haven't seen any issues with this. It took us a bit to get the settings right, to get us doing the networking right on the, at the Cassandra level, but once we figured it out, it just, it just runs now. The data access layer changes. They went back and forth on this a lot on determining where and when we were gonna try to get into making the switch. And so our app is very standard. It's, we have the UI interface, which talks to our business layer, and then also talks to the data access layer, and then that's what chooses our source. So we, for the SQL side, we use standard SQL, our standard C Sharp to get into our database, which returns us an iData reader. So what we did was we wrote our own customized JSON data reader so that it also returned the exact same results to our application. And so our data transport object coming from the data access layer back up to the business layer, is, it doesn't matter whether it came from solar or from SQL, it does the same thing. The way we did it was when the stored procedure comes in, we wrap that around our stored procedure class. At that point, we can chat, we can grab it and say, this store procedure is a special or not. If it was for the Cassandra project and it popped over to another table in the SQL table, in the SQL server, 
made a transition, it's known to DSC, and there we put the query string for solar. So then it pulls that up, does the JSON reader, grabs the data, and pulls it back into the iData reader, just like we do. Some observations. We find that SQL does take longer for the query than DSC. One of the reasons for this would be there are no joins, and we have a lot of joins in our data right now, and the index is pre-built as you've thrown your data into solar, so that means the index is always clean for us. We do find that because we're using the HTTP layer, SQL is more efficient on larger data set polls. So if somebody goes to the provider directory and is asked for Dr. Smith and doesn't care about anything else, they can get a lot of results turned back to them. SQL does a better job of throwing that across the wire than using HTTPS or HTTP. We can obviously switch off of going to, through solar and go down to Lucene to get out of that issue, but that was just something we've noticed. Fun things we've noticed afterwards are as we've been getting the data into solar, working on it, trying to figure out issues we had with it, we now it's started to say, ooh, it would be better if we designed it this way inside of DSC search. So if the day ever comes for a rewrite, we will most likely rewrite the provider directory structure to use things that take advantage of the way solar works in searching. We had a client and we have lots of clients and they like to do tests on us at different times and all of a sudden out of the blue I got this case that their provider directory results are not working anymore. And I was panicking, oh crap, what do we do now? We're gonna have to flip again. And I was looking through it and they didn't give us the queries they ran, they just gave us their total numbers. And so I got back with them and said, okay, what results were you looking for? What were you doing in your searches? Well then we took all that, threw it into our, into our test tools to try to figure out what in the world's going on, why is SQL reporting different numbers in solar. And they weren't lying. When we ran our tests, sure enough, results were way off. And we could not figure out what was going on. And it was just a surprise, but solar actually produces better results than our SQL does. Our SQL, if you have a zip code that's nine digits, and you send it a five digit zip code, you're not gonna find a match, because it didn't match the full text. In solar, that's tokenized on the dash. So five digit would work, four digit would work, either way it would work. If you typed in the name Jose, you might not get any results on the SQL side, but on the solar side it would understand that, oh, you want Jose, or you may want San Jose. And so it's kind, of, it kind of neat to telling our client then, oh, by the way, we switched you to a new system that does the searches better. They were happy, we were happy it wasn't broke again, that we did something wrong. And it was a neat thing we found out. Could, could you have forced that to work properly? Well, as expected in SQL with oh, using the different could. wild cards. And um, I wonder why that wasn't done from the outset. It's painful on cost for ease. When you have to start doing your likes inside of your, in a big, especially zip code's a small one, it could have easily done that. But on larger text fields in particular, you can get yourself in a mess on the timing of your likes. And our company really focuses on the reads and writes of every single stored procedure. And so the developer knew for sure that if he was adding extra things in the query and getting bad performance, he was gonna get tagged for it. Um, so that was, I'm sure, a choice by the developer to say, okay, I know this will be a tighter query. It won't pull the exact results back, but it should get us good enough. Challenges. There were challenges in making this transition. We load the data into Cassandra. Cassandra handles taking care of the indexing, matching the schema. But what we realized and found out was Cassandra would take whatever we put in the data. So if the date format was just a little different or the lat long was a little different, Cassandra didn't care, but Solar did care. And so we'd run into times where our, everything was broke on us. So during this time, as we're trying to fix these issues, we ran into a lot of schema changes. If you're not careful with your schema changes, then the index can get out of whack from the data that's in Cassandra. And we went round and round and round trying to find out answers to solve this. We were lucky in the fact that our data set was small, so we did a lot of drop it, rebuild it, drop it, rebuild it, trying to figure out what was going on. 
And when DataStax 2.0 was released, they actually included a new tool under the DSC tool that allowed us to do full index rebuilds when we needed. So we mucked with the schema, got some inconsistent results. We were able to use the DSC tool, rebuild underscore index, to solve any kind of index issues we caused ourselves. On the SQL side, we do lots of monitoring. We track every single query against our system. We track the reads and writes, report on them, and we are real hardcore on any kind of bad reads and writes. And so we've been doing this for 10 years and have really tightened down what are good reads, what are bad reads, and can know really quickly, you need to work on this sort procedure, you need to fix this query. We have yet to get that exactly in solar the way we are used to seeing it. And so we've had some issues monitoring solar work on just is everything okay, is it not okay, beyond just the standard IT things. Um, the developers would rather see that this store procedure work this way, because that's what they're used to seeing. And so we're working on ways right now to get our monitoring to look, even though it's coming from Cassandra, to make it look more like SQL. So they, get the so they can use comparisons there. So the future of DSC at HealthX. We started a new project. Oh, and the provider directory now has been live for about three months. And we haven't had any issues with it. Performance-wise, it's been running well. And the next thing was, okay, what's the next thing to put on DSC? So we have a new issue that came up. And it was file logging with email updates. So we get a lot of files from our clients, and they want to notify their members when a file gets updated. Sometimes this is notifying the HR person that hears you guys' billing statements. And sometimes it is to notify all the way to the member that, hey, there's been a plan change. We want to tell all the members about a plan change. We get about 50,000 files a day from our FTP servers. And so we decided to build this new piece in DSC also. And this piece uses only Cassandra. It doesn't use Solar, which was a little different from us. And this actually just went live yesterday. So now we use both SQL and DSC to send our notification emails. So the logging is all tracked to Cassandra. We run a job on that to go track to see who we need to send emails to look up the emails in our SQL server, and then push out the emails through email servers. Our next task we're looking at is moving more of our application logging to use Hadoop for reporting. We track every single click on our system, and including all the Web2 type asynchronous transactions. That can cause us hot spots on our SQL at times. And so we're looking at moving that application logging to the DSC ring to then take advantage of Hadoop reporting. The log doesn't need any indexes for itself, but for reporting, we need lots of different indexes on it, which causes issue on inserts then. And so we always fight limited number of indexes and speed of the inserts. We have a, a dream for us in uh, DSC is to ev eventually implement the one search box. And so the idea, and my, the owner always likes to say, we want a Google search. We want to be able to search for a doctor to be able to come in and say, show me all my patients in the one search box. To say, give me everything you know about Joe Smith. Or are we having a lot of broken arms for some reason? And be able to search in human text instead of just click this, click this, click this to get answers from our data. That's something on our list. We keep testing and doing little tests with it, and we haven't got great success yet, but we're continuing to work towards that. At this time, we're staying away from PHI on the, the cluster. We have a lot of security concerns with having HIPAA data. Um, we do have a partial solution for this, which is to do encrypted hard drives. And so we run IBM servers. They allow us at the RAID level to do encryption in the hard drives, which then would allow us to have our data at rest being encrypted, just like it is on SQL Server. But until we get that all settled and have better security on the front end, we're going to stay away from PHI and just look at it more for logging at this point. As soon as we have a full solution of security on Cassandra, then we'll start heavily looking at moving some of our larger data sets over to take advantage of solar searches in particular, but then also to try to the full transition off of SQL onto data stacks. 
We don't believe that SQL will ever go away. We have 10 years of applications being wrote under the database on the current system, but we see that new things we do will always look at Cassandra first. Any things that are giving us pains we'll look over. As we fix different things like the PHI issue, we'll look at new features of possibly duplicating data, becoming the Cassandra ring just becomes another option. And so we might have stuff running in SQL and both Cassandra or try to move some of our bigger subsystems over like our claim systems over. So Scott, you, you had a small project. You took a piece of it. You're working on the integration, um, 64 gig, not big not by any big. standards, right? We could put that on our phone or our tablets. Um, you, earlier in the presentation, you said open source, sort of, we're using data stacks. Why didn't you just go pure open source? Why not just go get Cassandra from the Apache site, Solar from the Apache site, have at it? Well, when you're used to the Microsoft stack, you're used to everything working together. You know, once you have Visual Studio running, it's all there. If you need to talk to SQL Server, you're gonna do it inside of Visual Studio. If you need to talk or write an application, you're gonna do it in C Sharp. Or you can even change your language and you're all in your Visual Studio. So the idea of, of losing that piece of glue for us, and now we're looking at, oh, maybe we have to use Java for a piece, or maybe we have to use Python for a piece. Oh, we gotta have Linux servers in here. They're not managed the same way we manage everything else. There was a lot of things to look at at one time. So we chose to go with the DSE product to get that expert knowledge on the open source stack. And so the first few conversations we had with data stacks was, hey guys, it is what it is, but there's only a few people who can spell Linux, let alone use it in our company. You're gonna have to help us through this transition as we're getting some things through. And so sometimes we ask stupid questions and it just is what it is. We didn't know the answer, we didn't know the answer. But they were always good in letting us ask the stupid questions, maybe ask the stupid question more than once also. And that was real important because if you have a developer that's been coding for 20 years, he knows his job, he knows how to write programs. And he did not like having to ask what he considered very simple questions because he could not find the answers was you know, different stack trimming. And do you see, they didn't care. We could ask the stupid questions to them. You know, there's always that little bit of fear of sending off your messages on the web, of them getting pounded because you're stupid for asking that question. And that was something that we did not have to worry about with data stacks. Um, you know, it's kind of like, now we, we paid just so too bad. You have to ask our, answer our stupid questions. And so that was very helpful for us and allowed us to get the project going faster give us a higher comfort level in what we were doing to make this success. So one thing I'll leave with, and then if anybody has questions, we can take some questions, but um, has this changed your recruiting makeup? Is the people that you're looking for now to come on as developers or as operators or, or whatever, how has it changed the skill sets that you're looking for and the types of people that you're hiring, are you finding that they're coming from obviously broader backgrounds now? You were very narrow in SQL before. Has it helped? Has it become harder? I, I know a lot of the challenges people are having with these new systems, particularly our customers, is uh, great once they get the technology going, but then they gotta source it. They have to find people to develop against this stuff and it's a, it's a new ecosystem. How's that been for you guys? It hasn't hurt us by any shape or form in the words. It probably has helped us a little bit. Um, our newer developers tend to be younger. And so the idea that we're running an open source product, it gives them the cool factor that they enjoy. Um, it's kind of funny, they're not the ones actually working on this project yet, but they talk about it. this is something they enjoy doing. So it definitely has opened us up and then also opened up our eyes on developers. Because before, obviously, we wouldn't talk to you unless you were a Microsoft stack guy because we ran Microsoft, that was it. Now, the guy that maybe has some open source experience, we look at him differently than what we used to. Yes? Once you made your decision on the DSE product, um, what was your development cycle from start to production for, for the provider service? So, in May of 2011 was when we finally decided that this is it. We started working with Cassandra as a very, very side project, just trying to get our hands, get our fingers wet, figuring out what's going on. So we took, we have ways to make um, our data sets. So we just started building data sets, throwing them in Cassandra, see what happens. And this was in 0.7 Cassandra. 
So there were a lot of things that wasn't there yet. Then we would kind of just, wife would get busy, we'd put it down for a bit. And so then about November of 2011, we ran into Salandra, which was Jake's, I can't say Jake's Luciani. last name. Luciani's project. And that, he did the first gluing of solar on top of Cassandra. So then we got excited about the search because we knew we had this problem in provider directory. It seemed like a good fit because the provider directory was a small subset. So we started really hard going down this pipe of looking at Slandra. Then right around the end of the year, we got into serious talks with Datastax. We had talked to them a couple times before, but now that we were looking that this was going to happen for real, I needed to have some support on this project. So around December, we started working with Datastax, and then Datastax told us, let's get the NDAs in place, and let's let you know we are going to be adding search. So we immediately got on the early access program, and so got basically Jake's Solander pieces that they had already thrown into the Datastax 2.0, and started working on it then. So for us, we started working on it hard in January. The application developer who did the glue piece on the data access layer, he probably didn't even start till March. And it was more of me on the, on the server side and my other developer trying to figure out what we're doing, having lots of issues at this time, working with Datastack saying, hey, we needed to do this or that. And then saying, no, actually you don't, you just need to do it correctly. And so the project really got full swing in the first part of this year. The second data stack was released with the 2.0. We upgraded everything, threw it up, ran tests, got into some schema problems, and it took us probably a month to really get that nailed. And so we went live then in April. And so the real time period was all the way from May to April, but we really were working hard on it for the first of this year. And it was a lot of, it was just, we're gonna try Hector, but we're going to try Picasa. Um, at first, he was fighting either one of those, and we were going to use Achilles, I believe, in the C sharps arena. And we were trying different things just to see what in the world was going to work for us. And also, the uh, file logging, we did end up switching to C using C sharp again for that, using the Fluent uh, library that's out for Cassandra. So we're kind of letting everybody just do what they want to do right now to try to figure out what's the best tool for this. Yes? What were the schema problems? Our schema problems was because Cassandra would accept the data, Solar wouldn't. And when the early releases we ran, Solar did not re re return the errors to us. So we were having some issues with performance also on getting the data loaded. And then once we got it loaded, Solar didn't know the answers. And so once we got working with Jake on that, Jake went, oh, I can expose that to you. And so then we realized that, oh, Solar doesn't understand our date format. And so once we just figured that out, then we flipped our date format to the correct format, and boom, magically it started working. We had the same issue with the lat long, getting that in the correct format. Because there was such a delay before the data access person started writing, we had all the Solar stuff done, he starts writing it, and then he says, oopsie, I need another field. And so then we went back in the schema, made the change, out the field, and that's when we started running little schema things. And we get that solved, and you'd say, oh, this field needs to be tokenized, it can't be just text. And then we tokenize that field, and as we were doing this, we're constantly updating the data, then we're getting, at that point, we were running live streams. And so we were just constantly running these little tweaks of changing the schema with live data coming in, and it just did not work well for us at that time. Now that we've stopped changing the schema, we haven't had any issues like that. Yes? When you're talking about that, uh, trying to develop an English like single search box, yes. uh, are you leveraging something native and solar to try to do that, or are you just running your own kind of parsers to generate solar? Where native and solar will handle what we looked at right now, and this is still very preliminary, we're just trying to figure this out. We're taking all of our keywords and throwing it into a single search box, the search field in the slant, slant, ah, solar. That will give us our answers back, and we're trying to work on the VA, the business logic part of how do you translate that to give them the right results. And the tests on the solar side of taking all the fields that matter and throwing it into one field in the solar side is working fine. You literally you know, rip out all the things you don't want, just put the answers in you do, put them in one field, tokenize it on the space, and that's been working fine for us. It's now taking that and giving good results. 
Any other questions? All righty. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Scott.